Good afternoon. The first item of business is portfolio. Point of order, Stephen Kerr. Uh, on a point of order, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I would seek some guidance from you in relation to a matter of urgency, uh, or, uh, as felt by my constituents um, and others. And on the 24th of November, Scotland's teachers will hold their first national strike since the 1980s. And I know that teachers are dedicated professionals. They don't want to strike. They want to be in school doing what they are qualified to do, teaching their pupils. However, they are sick to the bone of this Scottish Government failing the education of our children and ignoring the health and well-being of teachers. The Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills has not come to this chamber of her own volition to make a statement and to answer questions from members about what is being done to avert this strike. And teachers are anxious to be leaving their posts. Parents don't know what's happening. Pupils will have their education disrupted again. And I have a great deal of correspondence that shows that people are mystified as to why this matter is not top of agenda in the Scottish Parliament. Yesterday, we spent two and a half hours debating the future of Gaelic and Scots, and tomorrow, we will have yet another debate about Brexit, rehashing the same old tired arguments of the past. And as important as these matters are, I and many people who are tuned into the proceedings of this Parliament are mystified as to why we aren't discussing the fact that next week Scotland schools will close and pupils will miss lessons due to what up until now has been a failed pay negotiation conducted by Scot the Scottish Government. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, you will know that I have been seeking to raise this matter through all the normal channels open to me as a member of the Scottish Parliament. So, can you now please give me some guidance, Deputy Presiding Officer, as to what it takes to get a Scottish Education Minister to come to this chamber and to answer the questions of members about a matter as urgent and as important as an impending teacher strike. I, I thank uh, Mr Kerr for his contribution. Mr Kerr will be aware that's not a matter for the Chair. Uh, 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 as regards requesting a statement, it is open to the member, of course, to uh, approach the locus where it, it is uh, a decision for that locus, which, of course, the member will be aware is the Bureau. And it may be that the member therefore would wish to take this issue up with his own uh, party business manager in order that that matter could be pursued in the right place, which is the Bureau. Thank you. I, I think I have another point of order. Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, in Mr Kerr's point of order just, just now, he seemed to get that tomorrow's debate on Brexit was um, a government debate. Could I, I just want to inform yourself and the Chamber that this is a committee debate, giving the committee its opportunity to hear its concerns about Brexit in our most recent report. I, I thank Claire Adamson for that contribution uh, and it will have been noted on the record that it is indeed, in case there was any dubiety, uh, a committee debate tomorrow. And I would now propose to move on to portfolio questions. Uh, and the first portfolio this afternoon is Constitution, External Affairs and Culture. I remind members that questions five and seven are grouped together and that I'll take any supplementaries on these questions once they are answered. If a member wishes to request a supplementary question, they should press the request to speak button or enter uh, the letters RTS in the chat function during the relevant question. I call question number one, Alex Riley. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what support it is providing to the independent theatres in Scotland. Minister Neil Gray. Thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Government provides support to theatres through funding to Creative Scotland, who support world-class theatre through a portfolio of regularly funded organisations. Independent theatres in Scotland are eligible to apply to Creative Scotland's Open Fund, financed in 2022-23 by £16.3 million of National Lottery Arts funding for specific projects or productions. Alex Riley. I thank the Minister for that answer, I'm specifically focusing on the Alhambra in Dunfermline, which is the backbone of the nightlife economy. Obviously, 
a lot of theatres have struggled through COVID and are struggling to survive. Now the cost of living is putting up costs for them and those costs are being passed on and we're seeing reduced numbers. The only difference is that for most theatres in Scotland, they do get public subsidy, they get local authority subsidy, some of them are alios. Would you agree to meet with these these uh, independent sector theatres to see specifically what their issues are and how the government can support them to ensure that no more of them actually go to the wall. Minister. Thank you. And I thank Alec Rowley for uh, raising this point. And I understand uh, perfectly the, uh, the role that the Alhambra plays in uh, the local economy uh, in Dunfermline, as well as the contribution that it makes uh, to uh, wider cultural uh, needs as well. Uh, the, the Scottish Independent Theatres Association uh, wrote to me recently. I have replied, uh, suggest that on the 4th of November, offering to extend an invite to one of our forthcoming uh, roundtable uh, sessions that uh, myself and Angus Robertson are hosting with the culture sector to, to uh, discuss um, and chart a way through the very challenges that Alec Rowley has raised that are uh, facing the cultural sector here in Scotland, but also uh, are not unique to Scotland, but also being faced elsewhere in the UK. Of course, I'd be more than happy to meet with uh, Alec Rowley and the Alhambra Theatre as well. Um, and if you would like to re meet, uh, write to me to suggest such, I would be happy to take them up on that. Supplementary, Alistair Allen. Uh, I thank the Minister for that update and share in my colleagues' uh, worry about the viability of independent theatres during this Tory cost of living crisis. Uh, given uh, the welcome summit uh, this last week to bring together cultural organisations, uh, does the Minister agree with me that uh, Labour should join with us in calling for the, the UK Government as the architects of this crisis to make additional funding available to enable the Scottish Government to more effectively respond to the challenges which this and other sectors face? Minister. Uh, thank you. I thank Alistair Allen for uh, that question. Yes, I absolutely agree. Um, I appreciate this is an incredibly worrying time for the culture sector I, and agree that the UK Government should make additional funding available to address the cost crisis. It is not just an issue unique uh, to Scotland in terms of cultural institutions facing uh, challenges as a result of uh, spiralling inflation and a cost crisis that the UK Government failed to get to grips with, or in fact the impact that has been uh, felt by the COVID recovery funding being uh, withdrawn prematurely. These are issues uh, that are being faced across the UK, so we believe that it is incumbent on the UK Government tomorrow uh, to come up with the necessary funding to support uh, culture across uh, the UK. We will continue to press uh, the UK Government to do that. And we, through the roundtables that uh, Ms. Dr Allen has raised, will continue to work with the sector as best we can to support them through this challenging time. A supplementary, Sharon Dury. Creative Scotland has delayed their upcoming funding initiatives from 2023 to 2024 after what they've called a realistic prospect of serious cuts by the Scottish Government. This clearly will affect venues such as the Tron in Glasgow. What additional support will the government provide the sector to avoid other theatres closing their doors forever? Minister. Clearly, uh, Creative Scotland, the Scottish Government, are facing unprecedented challenges in terms of our funding situation as a result of spiralling inflation. Our own budget is worth £1.7 billion less this year than what it was when it was set in uh, December. Creative Scotland published an update on their uh, future funding framework, postponing this until uh, April 2025. This revised timetable gives the uh, time for the development work, the sector engagement and pre-application consultation in spring and summer 23, and will ensure that the process takes account of Creative Scotland. Scotland's uh, budget allocation and the context at that time. Question number two, Polly McNeill. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how long it plans to house refugees from Ukraine on the ship docked on the Clyde MS Ambition. Minister. Thank you, President Officer. We do not want to see anyone spend more time in temporary accommodation than is absolutely necessary. The MS Ambition was chartered on a short-term basis for six months to provide much-needed temporary accommodation for displaced people arriving from Ukraine. The contract is due to end in March 2023, and if required, those on board at the time of the ship's contract ending will be offered alternative temporary accommodation. It work continues to match those on board the ships to host uh, and longer-term accommodation, and matching teams are are operating on board, on board both uh, ships. And I thank all those uh, in Glasgow uh, regarding this question from the City Council, local, representative, uh, local representatives uh, and third sector organisations for everything they are doing to make our friends from Ukraine feel welcome. Polly McNeill. 
I thank the Minister for the answer, and they will be aware that MS Victoria being used to house Ukrainian refugees and at least has more cabins without portholes than with. And I wondered if he was able to tell me if that was the same with MS Ambition. Uh, the government don't seem to have set a time limit for this other than the end of the contract, and I was wondered if that would be the, the time limit. Um, windowless cabins in isolated ports, I'm sure the Minister will agree, is, is not the best for people fleeing war. But I, mean, want, I want to put on record and welcome the leadership the Scottish Government has given on the question of housing Ukrainian refugees, but I'm just looking for assurances that this can happen sooner rather than later. Minister. I, I thank uh, Polly McNeill for that question. Um, I, I've been on both boards, uh, as you'd expect, both uh, Victoria and Ambition. There are rooms that are windowless. The ship's company uh, and the city councils are operating to try to make sure that they are uh, shared across uh, the, the, the hallway to make sure that there are there are shared cabins for families to be able to utilise. Um, other uh, MSP colleagues, uh, Faisal Chowdhury has been on board, has been able to uh, see the standard of accommodation that there is both on Ambition and on Victoria. I would be happy to extend an invite for Polly McDeal to be able to see uh, that for herself as well. But I can assure her, first of all, in terms of the standard of accommodation, very, very strong, but also in terms of the work that we are doing to make uh, people stay on both ships and in the hotels as short as possible. Those are individual uh, uh, human-based conversations that need to be had, uh, both in terms of uh, people's desires but also needs. Um, but we're look, doing all we can uh, through the new digital matching tool to try to make that as swift as possible. A supplementary, Donald Cameron. Um, along with other MSPs, I visited the MS Victoria here in Edinburgh last week. Can I ask what action the government is taking to ensure that families with children who are already settled in schools can remain at those schools when they move from temporary accommodation to more long-term accommodation, whether on the MS Ambition, the MS Victoria or elsewhere? Minister. This, uh, I thank Donald Cameron for his question and I, I hope um, he found the visit to Victoria uh, informative. Um, we will do all we can uh, when we're matching people out of temporary accommodation and host accommodation. Uh, to ensure that people can have continuity in terms of their schooling, their education uh, and in terms of their employment. We will do all we can. Sometimes there will be disruption to that by the nature of the initial accommodation being temporary. But we're working with local authorities, in this case Edinburgh City Council, to try to do all we can uh, where people are matched uh, beyond uh, the initial locus of the schools to ensure that children can remain in those schools. It won't always be possible, uh, but I'm hap hap I will always do what I can to make sure that we can make that uh, as smooth the process as possible. Question number three, Gillian Mackay. To ask the Scottish Government how the £50 million fund allocated for the Ukraine Longer Term Resettlement Fund is addressing any issues of insecurity faced by affected Ukrainians. Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Since the latest uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, more than eight months ago uh, began, more than 21 and a half thousand uh, people from Ukraine with a Scottish sponsor have arrived here, representing a fifth of all UK arrivals, the most per head of any of the four nations. This fund uh, will help boost the overall supply of homes we can make available to support displaced people from Ukraine into longer term sustainable accommodation. I think that will help many find the security they need whilst they live in Scotland. The fund has so far provided over £400,000 to North Ayrshire and £6 million to Edinburgh City Council. Gillian Mackay. I thank the Minister for that answer. Can the Minister outline details of how the £5 million fund previously allocated for North Lanarkshire in my central Scotland region has directly impacted resettled Ukrainians? Minister. Uh, I thank uh, Julie Mackay for raising this. The £5 million awarded to North Lanarkshire Council, which was a, a pilot uh, granted as uh, ahead of the full fund being operational, uh, will help bring uh, up to 200 homes back into temporary use uh, in tower blocks in Coatbridge and Wisher to increase the number of homes available to support displaced people from Ukraine. We're already seeing the positive impact of this funding, uh, with over 20 families already having moved into the Wishaw tower block. And I was pleased to be able to see that for myself when I visited the Tower in Wishaw uh, last month and speak with the families who have recently moved in, understand that they are settling in well to their new homes uh, and uh, community. And I can also update that we expect the construction works at the Tower Block in Cope Bridge to be completed in December, which will further boost the supply of homes available to support Ukrainians rebuilding their lives in Scotland. And I want to thank North Lanarkshire Council and the community teams uh, around at those towers for all that they're doing uh, to be at the vanguard of, of this pilot project. A supplementary, Claire Adamson. 
Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And uh, can I thank the Minister for being able to attend a visit to the Gouth Rappel Flats in my constituency and see that work that is being done. Um, I think it's important that people understand that the um, Ukrainian families have a Scottish secure tenancy and that they have the same rights as other residents and tenants coming to live in those areas and to give um, some comfort to the people who may be reluctant and may be stalled in, in, in some of the cruise ships that the, the welcome is warm there and a secure um, family home for as long as is necessary is available for them. Minister. Thank you, Jane Officer. Yeah, I thank uh, Claire Amundsen for, for raising that point and for um, highlighting the benefits um, of, uh, uh, of utilising this longer term accommodation that's been made available. I was really pleased to be able to visit the flat flats uh, in Gautrapel with uh, Claire Adamson uh, last month and agree with her that it's positive to see the impact of this support, which is helping Ukrainians settle in Scotland. We're actively encouraging other councils and local uh, and housing associations to apply for this funding as well. My officials continue to work closely. Um, with authorities and RSLs to, on proposed projects. Additionally, I will be writing to all MSPs and MPs in Scotland to encourage members to work with councils and consider what properties in their area that could be brought back into use. I am keen that we take a flexible approach to maximise the number of units that can be delivered from this uh, funding and would encourage all colleges to consider possible sites and buildings in their areas that could be brought back into use or repurposed for long-term accommodation. Question number four, Stephen Kerr. Government, what assessment it has made of the impact of the removal of funding for Scotland's Winter Festivals Fund? Minister. Thank you, President Officer. The, the Scottish Government recognises the difficulties faced by the culture and event sector, um, uh, but had to take the extremely difficult decision to withdraw funding for the 22-23 Winter Festivals. Um, feedback from the events sector to Event Scotland confirms that some uh, previously funded events will continue to proceed, some with reduced offering, and others will have had to cancel. Event Scotland and Scotland's Event uh, Industry Advisory Group continue to work with the events sector, and there remains a, la a range of existing winter and festive events uh, planned by local communities and venues for both visitors and locals to enjoy. Stephen Kerr. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, the Minister, it seems, read a Christmas carol and saw Scrooge as an aspiration rather than a warning, because his is the only department not to have had its budget cut. So what was it that he prioritised over support for major Scottish festivals like St Andrew's Night, Hogmanay, Burns Night, was it another pointless foreign embassy, more civil servants to work on independence, or more lawyers to pursue pointless legal cases? Minister. Uh, to be fair, I think Stephen Kerr is better than that, quite frankly, President Officer. I respectfully remind, I respectfully remind Stephen Kerr I did not want to uh, take this decision, but he cannot divorce himself from association for the reasons why it was forced upon me. Um, spiralling inflation, a cost of living crisis that the Conservative UK Government, I assume. Excuse me, he... Minister, please resume your seat. Please don't shout from a sedentary position, Mr. Kerr. Minister, please resume. Thank you, uh, President Officer. Spiralling inflation, a cost of living crisis that the Conservative UK Government, I assume that he uh, still supports, um, uh, means that organisations across the culture sector, not just here in Scotland, but across the UK, uh, are facing financial diff difficulties. It is also left the Scottish Government's budget £1.7 billion down this year compared to when it was set in December. The challenges faced by the culture and events sector are shared across the UK. That is why it was folly for the COVID recovery fund to have been cut before a meaningful recovery took place and why I hope Mr Kerr will echo my calls for the UK Government to use the borrowing powers we do not have in Scotland to make sure that we can enjoy and invest in the sector using the Chancellor's statement to be heard tomorrow. Supplementary Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, we've already seen uh, the closing of Edinburgh Film, Film House and the loss of International Film Festival. How the current economic crisis is affecting Scotland's uh, cultural landscape. The withdrawal of this year's Winter Festival Fund will only intensify that problem for the cultural sector. What good? does it do for the Cabinet Secretary to be flying around the world promoting Scottish culture if cultural institutions and festivals in his own constituency are closing down for good? Minister. I, 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 to be, I, again, I, you know, I have had very positive engagement with Faisal Chowdhury on a number of issues, and I don't think he actually believes um, what he has read out there, that um, Scotland cannot... cannot um, 
that Scotland somehow is uniquely unable uh, to discuss issues of importance, shared importance, including um, uh, on uh, issues of international development and other areas that I know are close to Faisal Chowdhury's heart, that our, uh, our international network provides a huge amount of investment uh, to Scotland. It has provided significant economic benefit, and it is absolutely right that we continue to enjoy uh, our international network to ensure that it can continue to support our economy here in Scotland. Question number five, Liam MacArthur. Thank you to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what priority it attaches to developing relationships with other European countries. Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government continues to attach a high priority to developing relationships with other European countries. Doing so helps us deliver real benefits for Scotland, such as attracting investment and creating domestic opportunities. While we attempt to stem some of the undeniable harm that Brexit uh, is causing by protecting our friendship and links with European countries, we are absolutely clear that rejoining the EU at uh, the earliest opportunity as an independent country represents the best future for Scotland. Liam MacArthur. I thank the Minister for that response. Back in June, the Cabinet Secretary confirmed he had held discussions with the Commission on establishing international exchange opportunities for young Scots. However, uh, Ministers have admitted they have had no meetings specifically on their proposed uh, Scottish exchange programme. No funds are currently allocated to it, and there has not even been a consultation. Meanwhile, a £65 million scheme in Wales has already lined up over 5,000 international exchange opportunities from September this year, with funding for the next four years. Does the Minister believe that it is fair that young people in Scotland are being denied the same opportunities as their counterparts in Wales? And on that basis, can he confirm that the Scottish Government programme will be up and running from next September? Minister. Thank you, uh, thank you President Officer. And I thank Liam MacArthur for that question. As a fellow proud uh, European, um, uh, clearly we want to continue to uh, have strong uh, working relationships with our neighbours uh, in uh, Europe. And I'm sure his or Canadian constituents will recognise that the only re recognisable route that we have back into uh, Europe and enjoying the benefits of a full Erasmus programme would be by being an independent country. However, the Scottish Government recognises the importance of educational mobility. While we remain committed to Erasmus Plus, in the interim we are creating a Scottish Education Exchange Programme to support participants from across Scotland's education system. That is a programme for government commitment and will help maintain Scotland's place as an outward-looking, internationally connected destination for work and study. Question number seven, Colette Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve Scotland's relationship with European countries and any benefits such initiatives can have to Scotland's people, public services and businesses. Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, engaging with other European countries helps us build relationships uh, and unlock new economic and trading opportunities. It helps protect our interests in Europe in the light of Brexit and other recent events from the illegal war in Ukraine to the climate emergency and cost of living crisis. In May and June, um, I visited Baden-Württemberg to promote the game-changing tra trade opportunities emergence, emerging in the renewable sector and Warsaw and Krakow to show solidarity and to learn from their experiences over the impact of the war in Ukraine. Um, our relationship with European countries really matters when it comes to jobs, investment, export policy and cultural collaboration, and opportunities such as these are not taken by looking inward or staying at home. Colette Stevenson. I thank the Minister for that response. The Tory and Labour parties do not seem willing to accept economic and social consequences of Brexit which they support. Following the ending of freedom of movement, many EU nationals working in health and social care have left the country, making it harder for people to get the support that they need. Does the Minister agree with me that the only possible way we can develop economic and immigration strategies that work for us and rejoin the EU is Scotland to become an independent country. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer, and I thank Colette Stevenson. Yes, I do. Uh, Scotland has its own distinct immigration requirements, which are different to the rest of the UK. That has been recognised across this Parliament, uh, as all uh, future population growth is protected uh, to come from inward migration. The UK Government's immigration policy fails to address Scotland's distinct demographic and uh, economic needs and completely disregards key sectors relied upon during the pandemic. We were elected uh, with a clear democratic mandate to offer the people of Scotland a choice over Scotland's future and committed to an independent refer independence referendum during this Parliament. Supplementary, Emma Roddick. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Minister agree with me that the most effective way of deepening relations with our closest European neighbours while enhancing our position as a constructive partner on the world stage is to offer people in Scotland the democratic choice of embarking upon independence and restoring their status as citizens of the European Union? Minister. Uh, right. Yes, I absolutely do. And, uh, you know, There's broad relevance. And ask the, the member may regard that as, uh, as something he may not wish to hear. It's a debating point. There is relevance. I would ask the Minister to answer, focusing on the relevant bits. Thank you. Thank you, President Officer. It certainly wouldn't be for me to challenge the authority of the Chair. Um, I uh, absolutely agree with uh, Emma Roddick. I think she's absolutely right. Um, we've seen the folly of Brexit. We've seen the diminished uh, role that the UK now plays on the world stage as a result. Scotland is respected for its uh, work as a good global citizen. And uh, we want to continue our alignment with the rest of the EU pending our re-admission uh, re into the EU when we become an independent country. Question number six, Colin Beatty. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on any communication it has had with the UK Government regarding the potential impact on Scotland of the retained EU law revocation and reform bill. Minister. Thank you, President Officer. We wrote to the UK Secretary of State uh, for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, the latest one, on the 8th of November, after lodging our legislative uh, consent memorandum recommending the Scottish Parliament withhold consent for this bill. The letter clearly reiterates our significant and fundamental profound concerns regarding this bill, which were explained to the previous Secretary of State. This legislation puts at risk the high and vital standards people in Scotland have rightly come to expect from EU membership uh, represents further undermining of devolution and is being pursued with reckless speed. Colin Beattie. I thank the Minister for his response. Last week, a legal expert to the Constitution, Europe, External Affairs and Culture Committee said that while the UK's government's confusing dashboard of retained EU law currently contains over 1,400 pieces of legislation, this sweeping bill could actually affect as many as 5,000 laws, leaving dangerous gaps in the statute books. Can, can the Minister explain how the Scottish Government is preparing to alleviate the damage that could be done by Westminster's reckless Brexit obsession? Minister. Thank you, uh, President Officer, and I thank Colin Beatty for raising what is a, a really important and existential uh, question. The only way to alleviate this bill's damage to Scotland is for it to be withdrawn in its yep. entirety. Uh, should the bill continue to progress, uh, I'm urging the UK Government to accept amendments we published uh, on Tuesday, which would lessen its detrimental impact. But we need to be clear. The fact this bill has been introduced at all demonstrates the cost to Scotland of Westminster governments that people here didn't vote for and which are intent on posing a disastrous Brexit ideology which threatens the standards and projections, uh, protections we enjoyed as members of the European Union. We need shot of it to ensure we can set our own course, and that is by being an independent country. Question number eight, Jimmy Green. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on historic environment Scotland site closures. Minister. Thank you, President Officer. The access restrictions at some properties in care are regrettable. Uh, however, protecting individuals' health and safety must come first. Uh, Historic Environment Scotland has had to make uh, informed, responsible and technically sound decisions about safety. Its prioritised inspection programme has progressed well and they have now completed the first phase. Whilst Historic Environment Scotland undertakes this work, no site uh, is being left without care and there is full or partial access to 80 per cent of the properties that they care for. Uh, details of the inspection programme and site reopenings are published on the HES website. Jamie Green. Uh, thank you. Uh, regrettable is an understatement, Minister. Well, this comes off the back of years of chronic underfunding to protect these valuable sites and the devastating effect that it has on local tourism when people turn up to find them fenced off and crumbling, as is the case with Loch Ranza Castle on the Isle of Arran, for example. Uh, these must be addressed. Uh, we know that they're looking at very gloomy forecasts for their budget, but this isn't a budget question. This is about an organisational question. When is Historic Environment Scotland going to properly invest 
in these sites, get them back open to the public and get this much needed tourism back to these valuable assets that we have. Minister. Uh, Jimmy Green says it's not a budgetary question, but uh, the Historic Environment Scotland budget uh, is higher uh, this year than what it was pre-COVID, so we continue to invest in Historic Environment uh, Scotland. With regards to uh, Loch Ranza Castle, there has been the removal of the external fencing, but the site will remain closed internally until the high-level masonry survey is carried out. I think Jamie Green would uh, uh, agree that it's right that health and safety comes first, and the inspection date is still uh, to be confirmed. Um, I'm happy for uh, Jamie Green to, uh, to correspond with Historic Environment Scotland. They can host him uh, at either Loch Ranza Castle or any other of the site in, sites in his constituency. However, I note that he hasn't actually corresponded with uh, his to date. Oh. And supplementary, Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. One HES site that we in Shetland don't want to see close is Jarlshof, site of a prehistoric and Norse settlement, and described as one of the most remarkable archaeological sites ever excavated in the UK. What can the Scottish Government do to impress upon HES the importance of making progress with long-awaited toilet and car parking facilities to ensure that the visitor experience is not marred by having to search for the nearest public toilet? Minister. Uh, just as with uh, the questions from uh, Jamie Green, I'd be happy uh, to um, maintain contact with Hez regarding uh, the site in uh, Beatrice Wishart's uh, constituency. Uh, if she would um, take value from uh, a, a site visit with Hez to hear about the progress that they're making, uh, then I'm happy to make sure that that can be facilitated. Thank you, uh, Minister. That concludes portfolio questions on constitution. Uh, point of order from... Jamie Green, sorry. Thank you. In the response just given, notwithstanding the content of it, the Minister seemed to imply that he'd, uh, he knew of correspondence I had or had not have with a public body. First of all, can I ask how he knew that information? And secondly, could I ask whether it is appropriate for public bodies to share information of private correspondence between yeah. members and those organisations yeah. with Ministers ahead of portfolio questions? Because I would... Because I would be extremely concerned that ministers would be disclosing that sort of information to agencies or from agencies ahead of these question yeah. sessions to yeah. inform members Absolutely. of their responses in advance of questions even being asked in the chamber. That's right. uh, I thank Mr Green for his contribution. Uh, I would... I'm trying to respond to Mr Green's point of order and I'm not being assisted by members sort of muttering away from secretary positions. Uh, could I... Mr. Mountain, could I please perhaps respond to Mr. Green's point of order first? Would that be possible? Thank you very much indeed. To respond to Mr. Green's contribution, um, I, Mr. Green will be aware that the content of, of ministers' um, contributions, or indeed any member's contributions, are not a matter for the chair. The member will also be well aware of the various routes that he can pursue the matter through. Uh, and I would leave that one there, whilst I now take Mr Mountain's point of order. Sorry, Presiding Officer, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, I, I wouldn't want to do that because I wanted to hear your answer. My point of order was the fact that I couldn't hear your answer because there was some barracking going on in the background. And I find that, when I'm hard of hearing, quite difficult to, to comprehend. So I apologise, Presiding Officer, for interrupting, and I'm grateful that I heard your answer. Thank you, Mr Mountain. Uh, could I respond, please, to Mr Mountain's point of order? Thank you so much, Mr Kerr, for your kindness. I, I would say to Mr Mountain, I entirely agree that less barracking in the chamber would be beneficial to everybody concerned, including all our members in the public gallery who are here to uh, listen to how we conduct ourselves. Mr Kerr, point of order. Uh, I'm not sure what's happening, but perhaps you could. Maybe it's in the wrong way, perhaps. Or, I think we have. You right, know, so you. I, I'm grateful. I, I, forgive me for that uh, incompetence. Um, but I'm grateful to, you would take this point of order because I am deeply concerned by the insinuation in the answer, and I would like your clarity. Would it be normal, as a protector of Parliament, uh, would, would it be normal for a minister to have sought information from a, another public body about correspondence that may or may not have been engaged with between a member of this parliament and that public body? Because that is what was insinuated in the response. And if that were true, that would be pretty sinister from my point of view. 
I, I thank Mr Kerr for his contribution. That indeed is not a point of order because it's not a matter for the Chair. I would repeat what I said to Mr Green as regards the very first point of order on this subject, if I recall correctly, that uh, members, the substance of members' contributions, uh, broadly speaking, are not a matter for the Chair, as Mr Kerr well knows. However, if Mr Kerr or any other member wishes to pursue any particular matter, Mr Kerr will be aware of all the various routes through which that can be done. Thank you. I think we could now perhaps move on to the next item of business after a very short pause to allow uh, a change of front bench teams and so forth. Thank you. Okay, the next item of business is portfolio questions on justice and veterans. If a member wishes to ask a question uh, on a supplementary, uh, I'd ask them to press the request to speak buttons or put an RTS in the chat function if they're joining us remotely during the relevant question. And I call question number one, Brian Whittle. Yeah, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of several high-profile cases of antisocial behaviour in Scotland, what its response is to reports of escalating instances of antisocial behaviour at Kilmarnock bus station. Before inviting the Minister to respond, I would just um, note that there are some judiciary issues around this, um, this issue. But with that, I call the Minister to respond. Eleanor Whittam. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I support Police Scotland and their partners to take a proportionate response to antisocial behaviour, such as that recently experienced in Kilmarnock. The member and myself and other elected members attended multi-agency meetings that were debriefed um, after these events, which were, of course, a matter of some concern to us both and to the many other people in the area. Local partners confirmed that in recent weeks the situation has been improving, a full transport service has continued to operate, and that there have been fewer incidents. Work continues locally, but I commend the substantial effort so far to tackle this unacceptable behaviour to restore public confidence in the area. Brian Whittle. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that answer, but I wonder if the Minister would realise or recognise that this escalation in antisocial behaviour across the country is the cost when police numbers are cut and police time in the community is reduced because of the government hollowing out of backroom staff, meaning our police are spending more time in administration and less time on the beat. Does the Minister realise that these cuts are a false economy? Minister. What I would say to the member is that we have invested £10 billion in Police Scotland since 2013. We also have the highest number of police officers per capita in the entirety of the UK. And as for going forward into this year, I would ask the member to implore on his colleagues in, in Westminster that they ensure that this parliament is adequately resourced to deal with the problems that we have going forward in this area. I would also like to point out that antisocial behaviour has been on a downward trend since 2013, a little bit of an uptick during the pandemic but we are seeing that um, reverse again and we are working closely with the Scottish Community Safety Network to, um, on a consultation to better understand how we prevent antisocial behaviour um, and to help build up a robust picture of what the issues are. And a brief supplementary from Willie Coffey who joins us remotely. Mr Coffey. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I asked a similar question a few weeks ago and Police Scotland also gave me assur an assurance that measures were in place with key stakeholders to manage this issue and that no additional resource was required. The Cabinet Secretary recently said to me that he and colleagues would give some consideration to the suggestion of withdrawal of bus passes should that be established as contributing to the antisocial behaviour. Could the Minister update the Chamber on progress with this, please? Minister. I thank Willie Coffey for that question. I can confirm that the Cabinet Secretary has written to the Minister for Transport about measures that have been taken to address antisocial behaviour in the transport networks, and you will be updated on that soon. And I understand that, for instance, the bus and rail operators can choose to restrict access to services in line with their own terms and conditions of carriage. Um, and I would say that the free bus passes for young people aged up to 22 years old continue to be a success. We've had um, nearly 27 um, million um, journeys since January, um, and we, we can't limit um, the access to this service for those young people who are travelling um, and, and well behaved. But we will come back to the member on the issues that he raised. Question number two, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on how it is tackling antisocial behaviour, including on the railway network. Minister. 
as I said previously, I support Police Scotland and its partners to reduce antisocial behaviour, making full use of the available resources and powers. These include the use of antisocial behaviour orders and fixed penalty notices alongside diversionary activities. I also support the British Transport Police, who lead on law enforcement on railways, and work with Police Scotland, transport operators and local authorities to make public transportation safe. In Inverclyde, BTP has worked with ScotRail's tra and travel safe team specifically to reduce antisocial behaviour. And I commend my colleagues' work as chair of the Inverclyde Community Hub and the sustained improvement that has been seen in the area. Stuart McMillan. I uh, thank the Minister for that reply and I wish her well in her new role. Inverclyde is well served when it comes to the number of railway stations, but that certainly has proven to be a driver for some antisocial behaviour in parts of the constituency. The presence of the British Transport Police is vital for dealing with antisocial behaviour on the railway network. So I can ask whether the Minister will engage with the British Transport Police to ensure that the BTP officers covering the Inverclyde railway lines have the resources to deal with the seasonal antisocial behaviour that happens. Minister. Again, I commend the work that's been done locally to make the Inverclyde network as safe um, a transport environment as it can be. And I understand that low levels of antisocial behaviour are now being reported. BTP officers work constantly to provide visible presence on the railway network in Scotland. And as we approach the festive season, they will conduct an increased number of on-train patrols to minimise antisocial behaviour and provide reassurance to the travelling public and the rail staff. Um, and I can ask um, that the Chief Superintendent in charge of BTP in Scotland will write to the member with more details of their plans to deal with seasonal antisocial behaviour. Okay, question number three comes from Annie Wells, who joins us remotely. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will implement the licensing scheme set out in the Fireworks and Pyrotechnic Article Scotland Act 2022. Minister. Work is underway to implement the remaining provisions within the Fireworks and Pyrotechnics Act so that further positive change is in place for communities as soon as possible. Whilst the Act sets out the core elements and functions of the licensing system, further work is required to operationalise it. This includes progressing regulations um, to set out the administrative details, which will be widely consulted on, as well as an IT system development. Therefore, in line with the timescales that were set out when the Act was introduced, the earliest the system will be in place is late in 2023 or early 2024. Annie Wells. I thank the Minister for that answer. Scenes of antisocial behaviour we witnessed, including in Glasgow, was unacceptable. The SNP's flawed fireworks bill could have prevented thugs who commit antisocial behaviour from purchasing fireworks, but the SNP rejected our amendments which would have enabled this. Does the Minister still believe those convicted of antisocial behaviour should be able to buy fireworks? Minister. I think as part of the, the licensing condition, those that have been um, um, found guilty of antisocial behaviour will have to disclose that when they are applying for a licence. And I would just say that Police Scotland have confirmed that they have made 18 arrests so far following recent public disorder incidents. And we understand that the fire and fire um, related calls on the 5th of November were down by 10% on last year um, to just under 600, um, for, um, sorry, to just over 500. And we understand also that there's a decline in the number of calls on the 4th of November was even steeper. And what I would say is that on, after the night, the gold commanders did tell us that the new legislation was hugely helpful to them. Supplementary, Gordon MacDonald. Given the incidents in my constituency over Bonfire Weekend, can the Minister outline how the licensing scheme and indeed other measures within the Act will reduce the inconsiderate use and misuse of fireworks? As brief as possible, Minister. The licensing system will put robust checks and balances in place before someone is permitted to purchase, possess and use fireworks in Scotland. Mandatory elements such as the training course and the requirement to disclose relevant convictions upon application will ensure that license holders know how to use fireworks in a safe, lawful and considerate manner. The measures set out in this groundbreaking legislation, combined with the wider activities set out in the Fireworks Action Plan, such as education and awareness raising with our partners, are part of our holistic approach to addressing the harm and distress that fireworks can Cause. Very briefly, Faisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Edinburgh has recently seen evidence of the damage that reckless use of firework can do in conjunction with antisocial behaviour. Now that there is a legislative framework for a licensing scheme, can the Minister uh, give assurance that Police Scotland have the necessary resources to enforce the law as passed by the Parliament? As briefly as possible, Minister. 
I would say that at this stage, um, we are not in the, in the, the immediate budgetary process, um, and that, that is something that we will take into consideration going forward, because we absolutely want the police to be able to respond and implement the act that we have passed in this place. Thank you. Question number four, Evelyn Tweed. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps are being taken to highlight the risks of drink spiking as we near the Christmas party season. Cabinet Secretary. Several roundtable meetings have taken place to help steer the joint Scottish Government and public sector response to the act of spiking. Significant work was undertaken to raise awareness and heighten vigilance in the run-up to the return to university and college campuses. We are currently working with members of the roundtable to bring together the range of initiatives and information within one source area in advance of the festive period to reassure the public that there is a coordinated response to the dangers of spiking in whatever form it might take. Evelyn Tweed. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Police in Stirling have recently praised licensees in the city centre for working with them on a range of initiatives, including staff training, awareness and promotion of the Ask Angela scheme. Does the Cabinet Secretary join me in praising the work of city centre licensees in Stirling? And what steps will the Scottish Government take to encourage this collaborative approach across Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I do indeed praise the work of Stirling Council. Ask for Angela is, of course, one of several safety initiatives that have been promoted under the Best Bar None Scheme, the administration of which is funded by the Scottish Government through the Scottish Business Resilience Centre. And I certainly welcome and support the good work in Stirling and indeed across the country, which is reflective of the coordinated approach that we will continue to promote as part of the Scottish Government-led Roundtable Forum to tackle the abhorrent act of spiking. Brief supplementary, Russell Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, when Jess Insel was spiked in a night out in Glasgow, she felt badly let down by the police and NHS, and six months later she's still waiting for her test results. Since raising her case with the First Minister, I've been contacted by many other victims. Spiking is sinister, dangerous and widespread. Victims like Jess have little faith in yet more talking shops and would like to know what meaningful action will take, be taken to protect them and to bring predators to justice. Cabinet Secretary. Can I say that if the member has information about cases of spiking, he should pass those on to the police with the proper authority that will consider it and they can take the action. That would be the sensible and responsible thing to do. And briefly, Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Drink uh, spiking. Ms Wishart, could you resume your seat? Point of order, Russell Finlay. Yeah, just for the purpose of clarity, it's a very important point the Cabinet Secretary raises. Uh, any individual who's contacted me with information about spiking they have decided whether or not it's right for them to do so, and it's not my job to uh, disrespect their wishes and report that to the police. Thank you, Mr Finlay. That was not a, a point of order, but you've got it on the record. Briefly, Beatrice Wisher. Drink spiking is serious and no one should be victim blamed or victim shamed. Will the Scottish Government ensure that whatever it steps to highlight the risks of drink spiking, it will do so with the engagement of a wide range of organisations and others? ensuring that the right ethos is captured throughout the process. Cabinet Secretary, as brief as possible. Yeah, I can give the member that assurance and also say that is what we've done, whether it's been um, landlords, uh, the organisations which I've mentioned already, with the police, with universities and higher education representatives and representatives of students. So we will continue to do that, taking this forward. Question number five, Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its proposed consultation on the separation of the functions of Scotland's law officers. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, work is progressing towards a Scottish Government consultation and development of the consultation will be informed by an initial phase of expert research, which is currently underway. This research will ensure a detailed baseline understanding of the many distinct roles and functions of the law officers and will provide information on how the functions of law officers operate in other countries as well. Murdo Fraser. The Cabinet Secretary for uh, that response. This consultation was uh, originally promised not in this year's programme for government, but in last year's uh, programme for government, and we haven't heard much about it since. So it's good to hear that some progress uh, is being made. It is an important matter. There is clearly a potential conflict of interest between the roles of the law officers as heads of the prosecution service and also legal advisers to the Scottish Government. This issue was resolved in uh, the English and Welsh system more than two decades ago. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us when he expects 
us to get some concrete progress on this. Cabinet Secretary. I can just uh, first of all correct uh, Murdo Fraser. Of course, it was mentioned in the programme for government, but not for completion in this year. This is a, a commitment that we will take, undertake through the parliamentary term. We have around 20 bills to take through in this parliamentary term, and that will be one of them, as we stated. And also to say, of course, the example of the UK, which he gives, of course, we've had in the past the Lord Chancellor, who was head of the judiciary, was part of the executive and the legislature. And that is not a clearly resolved situation in England and Wales. But it's right, of course, we do learn the lessons and take forward some of the uh, indications that we get from this research. The reason for that is because there's surprisingly little research being done on the role of Scottish law officers. And I'm sure the member would agree it's right to proceed with the best foundations to have the research done to inform the consultation that we then undertake. That seems to me to be the responsible way to go forward. Question number six, Daniel Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to prevent motorcycle thefts in light of reports of rising motorcycle theft numbers. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, measures to combat motorcycle theft are an operational matter for Police Scotland. Since 2012-13, crimes of dishonesty, which includes motorcycle theft, have reduced by 32 per cent. However, that should not detract from the, seriousness, uh, the serious nature of these incidents. Supporting Police Scotland to keep our community safe remains a priority for the Scottish Government. Uh, policing services have been maintained and improved, and as we have heard, we have invested over £10 billion in policing since 2013. And we will continue to support the vital work of Police Scotland in delivering effective and responsive policing across Scotland. Daniel Johnson. And the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. As he probably knows, motorcyclists are 11 times more likely to experience vehicle theft than other vehicle owners, but it's not currently separately reported. This is a long-term problem, but in recent months it's definitely been getting worse. I've received reports of motorcyclists being bike-jacked at traffic lights and B&B owners having their guests' uh, motorcycles uh, stolen, which obviously has an impact on our important tourist industry. So can I ask, what communication has the Cabinet Secretary had with Police Scotland about improving reporting, updating their standard operating procedures and with local authorities on the security steps they can take? And I am hosting a roundtable on the 28th of November with police... Um, motorcyclists and motorcycle retailers and guest house owners. I would be very happy to have either the Cabinet Secretary or the Minister for Community Justice if they'd consider coming along too. Cabinet Secretary. I hope the member will allow me to check my diary before committing to undertaking that commitment, uh, but if it's a possibility, I'll certainly do that. And also, in relation to the points uh, the member makes about the reporting of these crimes, that would really be properly a matter to take up with the relevant authorities. We don't uh, direct uh, statistics. It may well be there's a very good case to be made, but can I suggest to the member, I'm, well, I'm happy to write to him and tell him exactly where he might best take up that issue, both with the police, but also with the statistics authority. Uh, it's true that over the 10 year period from 2012 to 13, theft of motor vehicle crime has seen a decrease of 21 per cent. However, theft of a motor vehicle has seen a 5 per cent increase in the most recent year. So that may include those for motorcycles. But in terms of uh, the uh, reporting of these incidents, can I suggest he takes that up once he's had the confir confirmation from me of the best place to go to try and raise that issue? Be supplementary, Jamie Green. Uh, the offence of theft of a motor vehicle rose 10 per cent last year. Uh, can I ask uh, how the Cabinet Secretary would respond to Deputy Chief Officer David Page, who made it clear that offences such as theft and burglary will simply go to the bottom of the queue as officers struggle to meet demand uh, in an environment of reducing police numbers? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I say that I don't have the same figure that Jamie Green just mentioned? I have the figure of a high percent increase in the most recent year, from 4,311 4, crimes uh, to 4,512. And can I say that, and also in relation to the resourcing of the police, we've heard this already, we have far more police in Scotland. They are better paid. We have lower crime in Scotland. Perhaps the Tories should take the example of Police Scotland and inform their colleagues how to run a police service south of the border. Question number seven, Edward Moon. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on when HMP Highland will become operational and whether it will accommodate female prisoners. Cabinet Secretary. The construction of HMP Highland is currently scheduled to complete in late 2024. An opening date will be confirmed near the time to ensure the prison is operational within a sufficient time frame to allow for commissioning and staff familiarisation. There are a limited number of spaces for females which were used to accommodate brief stays for court appearances. Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. A lot in that. Well, look, a new prison was promised in 2011 promised again in 2016 with a price of 66 million with a completion date in 2020. Now the price, without it going out to final design or tender, 
is 140 million, and yet the Cabinet Secretary feels confident he can give a date of when it's be completed. Th the simple fact, the longer is you delay, the more you're going to pay, Cabinet Secretary. Can we please have a confirmed date when it will go out to tender so we will know when it will be completed? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I say, first of all, I, I don't know whether Everett Mountain supports the building of a new prison in Highland. This is an example of commitment of the Scottish Government to Highland. I would, think, I would mention also in that regard the Berrydale Braes, which for generations uh, were left in the state they were by previous governments. I'd also uh, say the work they were doing on the A9 when the Conservatives, like Murdo Fraser, wanted to put the money towards trams in Edinburgh. So I think we have a strong commitment, we have a strong commitment to uh, the Highlands. The building, as I've said, is scheduled to complete in 2024, but I do not. Cabinet Secretary, can you resume your seat? Point of order, Murdo Fraser. I'm very grateful to you, Presiding Officer. Can you please tell us what remedies are available to members who wish to correct the record? Well, they've clearly told an untruth to the Chamber about the voting record of another member, as we've just heard from the Cabinet Secretary. Mr Fraser, I think you're well aware of the remedies um, uh, to deal with that. Could I just observe that we've had a number of points of order over the, uh, the course of these two portfolio sessions, which is simply eating into the time to allow other members in for portfolio questions. Brief supplementary, Colette Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. I very much welcome the uh, Cabinet Secretary's update in relation to HMP Highland. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me the modernisation of the estate will transform support available and enhance dignity for people in custody? Briefly as possible, Cabinet Secretary. That's exactly the case. And of course, we could also mention the new Justice Centre in Inverness, uh, funded by this government. But the record will show, uh, President Officer, I think you are a member of this parliament as well, that Murdo Fraser voted to have trams at a cost of £500 million. Uh, I made that point. And he's never accused me of an untruth. So we will have to see how that figures in the official report. I'll not do as has been done repeatedly through these exchanges, raise a point of order. But I do think it's important that members stick to the facts. Question, question number eight, Paul O'Kane to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reported concerns raised by the Chief Constable and SPA Chair regarding the impact of the reverse, reverse spending review on service delivery in Police Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we remain fully committed to using the resources available to us to support the vital work of the Scottish Police Authority and Police Scotland and will continue to invest across the justice system in 2023-24 and support the continued operation of vital frontline services, provide support for victims and witnesses and tackle the underlying drivers of offending. Paul uh, Police officers in Scotland have been sounding the alarm for some time now as to the lack of support they have been experiencing. Uh, Police Scotland is already being starved of funding by this government. Indeed, senior officers have explicitly called for access to equipment like body cameras, but have stated that they have no budget uh, to be able to deliver what is described as basic kit. That would give them parity with their counterparts elsewhere in the UK. Indeed, these cuts will have devastating implications for community policing uh, and, and elongating call-out times and enabling crimes of dishonesty to increase across our communities unresolved. So I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to listen to frontline police officers and explain how he will deliver the basic equipment and resources they need against the backdrop of his proposed cuts. Cabinet Secretary. Well, we have seen, of course, a situation where the police in Scotland are better paid than any other police force in the UK, including in Wales. In fact, a starting constable starts on £5,000 a year more in Scotland. Never heard a word of commendation for that. It's also true to say, of course, we have more police than anywhere else in the UK, which is quite an important point, and which has helped us lead to having some of the lowest crime figures ever recorded, also the lowest homicide figures ever recorded. There is no question there are challenges in relation to budgets, but surely the member must see the cause of this is the Brexit fiasco that we've seen down south, the cuts to our budget. And once in a while you would think the Labour Party would draw attention to the real problem here, which is underfunding from Westminster. I've got two brief supplementaries. I'm keen to get them both in, but the questions will need to be brief and likewise the responses. First, Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Despite UK Government austerity, the Scottish Government has invested more than £10 billion in policing since the creation of Police Scotland in 2013. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the UK Government must no longer impose renewed austerity, thereby worsening the extreme pressures already being faced, but instead make additional funding available so that we can provide our vital public services, including policing, with the funding required? Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, well, I do agree with that, and it seems obvious to me, not just for the Scottish Government, but certainly for other public services in England and Wales, if you have runaway inflation caused, of course, by the economic mismanagement of the Tories, surely you have to acknowledge that within a year. The additional pressures caused by cost of living, whether it's police pay, whether it's paying for heating and lighting and feeding in hospitals, jails, in police stations, surely we'd recognise that, but there's not been one word from the Conservatives or, as far as I know, Labour saying you have to increase the funding available if you want to protect these public services. So just as we've done with the police, we will continue to pro protect all the public services in Scotland to the best of our ability with the resources available. I'm Willie Rennie. Uh, Alex Salmond and Kenny McCaskill repeatedly told us that police centralisation was essential to protect police budgets. Why has that promise not been kept? Uh, well, I, I don't know whether Willie Rennie was here either on when he heard the figure of over £10 billion pounds of funding since the creation of the single force in 2013. And I talked to senior police officers as well as uh, uh, rank and file police officers on a regular basis. They believe that the single force is a great um, uh, uh, development. It's one of the best examples of public sector reform that we have had. I'm not wishing away the issues that there were in the earlier years. But it's extremely effective, and I would cite in support of that the way they dealt with COVID, the way they dealt with COP26, and the way they dealt uh, with the death of the monarch. I think the police service in this country is excellent, and they have been well supported over the years, although I do acknowledge, of course, there are budget pressures because of the cuts that we're now seeing from Westminster. That now concludes portfolio questions. There will be a brief pause before we move to the next item of business to allow front benches to change.